Johnny Fontana. The role of a public insurer is to paint a painting, to okay. paint for you a canvas, okay. a, a panorama of everything. He can say, he has full right to say, because he's human, but some of them are human, and they have right to say, listen, this is the, these are the solutions, I mean, one to 19. Yeah. I personally think that 17 and 19 are the best. Mm. Why I think? Because there is that they have a right to an opinion, yeah. but not before they have painted for you yeah. the total picture okay. in a totally unbiased and unprejudiced way. Yeah. No one is doing this today. Hope everyone is staying safe and doing their thing, being well. Because when you face a complex, ever-changing, uh, shape-shifting uh, world, mm. it's frightening, it's yes. disorienting. Yeah, yeah. Um, intellectuals public intellectuals, are anxiolytics, anti-anxiety medication. Right. <laughs> they should reduce your anxiety. Yeah. I mean, you come, uh, what's going on here? I don't understand what's happened. Yeah. Sit down. <laughs> it's not the first time it's happening. Yeah. It happened before in the 1940s, yeah. and then this is what happened, nothing. Then it happened in 1920, it was bad, but after seven years it was okay. I mean, yeah. they should calm you down. Yes. I just wanted to uh, share this video that I created. Um, it's a montage, you know, as I always do, of different clips um, with regards to, you know, where we are with COVID-19, right? This is not to persuade or to dissuade or to um, tell people this is what they should be doing or this is the new conspiracy theory. No, as in what I do all the time, it's provide perspective, provide context and to say, hey, this is what we are up against. This is the situation. This is not to scare anyone. Obviously, this is not, there isn't there any material that's going to scare anyone. Actually, in today's age, analytical skills are considered sometimes antisocial mm -hmm. or asocial. Yeah. So, and of course, the public intellectual should be above all an intellect. He should be, he should be analytical. Yeah. He should offer ideas dissected rearranged in a way that present both sides yeah. uh, for your perusal and decision. Right. But public intellectuals never do this anymore. I can't think of a single time Not one. I've ever witnessed that. I agree, yeah. Not one. Sit back, it's about 28 minutes. Like I said, it's a montage, different clips from different professionals. I'll leave uh, some links down below so you can actually go and do your own research, right? But again, this is too, further demonstrate that you don't take everything that everyone says or that you read at face value. You actually do your own research, you put things into perspective, put things into context, and then you formulate your own opinions, your own ideas, and then you share that information based on sound and proper, reasonable information. Johnny Fontana, let's go. Anthony Fauci is a famous medical celebrity in the United States. He is the Tsar of the medical response of the United States to the COVID-19 pandemic. Anthony Fauci has published a series of academic papers in which he had calculated the case fatality rate, the virulence, the, the death rate associated with SARS-CoV-2, with the virus, he calculated this rate to be 0.1%. Two quotations, Jay. Here's Dr. Anthony Fauci. We all know he's as famous as the president right now. He's the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. And here he is in early March, just a couple of weeks ago. Quote, the flu has a mortality rate of 0.1%, one tenth of 1%. This, meaning the coronavirus, has a mortality rate of 10 times that, close quote. And then a day later, two days later, after publishing these articles, he appeared on the media, on the popular media. And there he said that the case fatality rate, the death rate associated with the virus is 1%. I happen to have degrees not only in, in medicine and other, other fields, but I'm a po I have postgraduate educa education in physics and complex high-level mathematics. So I do a lot of modeling, which includes ultra-complex and sophisticated extrapolations. Unfortunately, the majority of medical professionals suck in mathematics. They get their models and the predictions of these models utterly wrong. For you to understand, 
an art he published an article in the New England Medical Journal on March 26, where he had calculated the death rate to be 0.1%. And then on March 27th, he appeared on Comedy Central, and he said the death rate is 1%, knowing full well that he is providing inaccurate information, not to use worse terms. Here's Dr. Jay Bhattacharya in his piece in the Wall Street Journal. Again, this is March 24th, just a couple of days ago. Quote, and you're talking about uh, when you think the first the virus was first seeded in this country. Quote, an epidemic seed on January 1st implies that by March 9th, about 6 million people in the U.S. would have been infected. As of March 23rd, it's that Monday of this week, there were 499 COVID-19 deaths in the U.S. That's a mortality rate of zero. 0.01%. In other words, a whole order of magnitude less than Dr. Fauci claimed just a couple of weeks earlier. I, mean, I think the thing is, nobody knows the number. The WHO, World Health Organization of the United Nations, announced that COVID-19 is growing exponentially. Now, I happen to be a mathematician, and an exponential series is a well-defined mathematical construct. You can't just play with words. Consider the following. If one person got infected, patient zero, and then this person passed his infection on to two other people, and he did it in four days, and these two other people, each one of them infected two other people, also in four days. After 120 days, how many cases do you think would be, would have been? When I talk to people, they tell me 10,000 cases, half a million cases. The really audacious ones, the daring ones, tell me that there'll be a million cases. Well, here's the number. Taking these assumptions into account, one patient infects two patients in four days, two patients in four, infect four patients in four days, already eight days have passed, and only uh, seven patients are infected. So after 120 days, there would have been 536,870,912 infected folks. Yes, you heard me right. Okay, but you say, you're not taking into account travel restrictions. You're not taking into account social distancing. That's why we don't have these numbers. Wrong again. Social distancing started in earnest a mere six weeks ago. Travel restrictions have been imposed widely four weeks ago. If I take these two into account, the number drops from 536 million to 90 million. The situation is even worse than what I'm saying because the WHO makes even more egregious assumptions. WHO claims that the growth factor is two to three. The WHO says that the doubling time is two to three days. Had I adopted the assumptions, the outlandish, outlandish assumptions of the WHO, we would have had to import Martians and to infect them because we would have run out of eligible humans. I think I know how you'll answer this, but maybe I'm not sure. What's Dr. Fauci up to when he says this is 10 times more lethal than the flu. He cannot know that. He should not be saying that. He cannot know, can he? But many people, you are talking about Dr. Fauci right now, many people are questioning both Dr. Fauci and Dr. Birx when it comes to these models that continue to change and their motives, which you kind of touched on a little bit. What is your take on these doctors that are advising the president and why they're advising him the way that they are? Look, if you look, uh, Christina, at the typical MD, many of them go into wanting to become a doctor out of some noble service. But fundamentally, the medical school education is really a big pharma a medical education where the doctor is really trained, if this, then this. And the then is typically a pharmaceutical drug or some uh, harsh medical intervention. Mm -hmm. 
Now, if you look at someone like a Fauci and Bricks, they're sort of at the top of their quote unquote game, which means they're highly embedded into the big pharma model of medical education and the big pharma model of what the solution is. And that solution is typically a direct line from this disease, find typically a virus or a bug, and then recommend a vaccine or some harsh chemical solution. Um, he doesn't Which, know. He doesn't know. Yeah, and All he right. can't know because nobody has done the, the serologic, it's the, sorry, sorry to use check but like the serologic test means how many people in the population have antibodies to the virus. So that's what you need to know. Okay. No test has so, done like that. So we, he can't know that. Nobody knows that. So he's reflecting is his guess on what that is. And uh, I'm reflecting my guess on what it is. The fact is neither of us know it. Now, shockingly, not a single randomized double blind trial with a control group had been conducted on any population anywhere in the world. This is, this defies belief. So the concentration of severe illness in a given place at a given time is unusual, is specific to the pandemic. And one of the critical data points I've had real difficulty finding and the United States needs badly is what is the ratio of people who have the virus, recover from it maybe with no symptoms or mild symptoms, the, the percent of that group that winds up being sick enough to seek medical care, the percent of that group winding up sick enough to need hospitalization, the percent of that group sick enough to wind up in the ICU, the percent of that group that winds up on a ventilator, and ultimately the percent of that group that dies. What we tend to hear about now is some level of population testing. So, you know, something about the numbers infected and something about deaths. A lot of those data in the middle we haven't been getting. So it's really hard, even for experts in epidemiology, to say we're exaggerating the risk. What if for every person who dies, there are, say, 30 who wind up in the ICU? And what if the 29 who survive to make it out of the ICU need intensive care on a ventilator for three or four weeks. That's an enormously intensive demand on the medical system. And, and my impression is that the numbers are something like that. So we can easily get this wrong in either direction. The first thing we do in epidemiology, we take 10,000 random, a group of, a random group of 10,000 people and we test them to see if they have COVID-19, if they have uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2, if they have the virus or not. That's the first thing. The thing is, nobody knows the number. The numbers we've seen are consistent with a very, very wide range from, a, from an epidemic that will kill two to four million people on one end and an epidemic that will kill 50 to 50,000 to 100,000 people on the other. That's a that's an incredibly broad range. And the policies you do to avoid two to four million deaths are very, very different than the policies you do to avoid you know, 50,000 to 100,000 deaths. I can't tell you, as someone who has studied medicine, I can't tell you how shocking this is. And doubts are also rising regarding the cause of death in many cases, especially with the elderly, the immunocompromised, and those with pre-existing conditions. Was the virus just present in their bodies when they had died? Or did the virus cause the death? No one knows. Someone dies, they test the body to see if there's COVID, if there's um, if the virus is present. Yes, it's present. They chalk it off. They say, well, he died of the virus. That's not always true. Someone could die, for example, from a heart attack, and their body is full of the virus. And yet, it was not the virus who killed them. There is no such distinction made. Uh, I was somewhat reassured in the early going that young people seem to be pretty much impervious to the, the severe adversities of coronavirus. And then inevitably, we started hearing about young people being hospitalized and the occasional young person dying. Now, that's not all we need to know because, you know, bad things happen to people all the time in, in the world and all the time in medicine, and sometimes they're anomalies. And, you know, and sometimes cancer occurs in a young person. We don't know why. It's very rare, though. And the same may be true of coronavirus. It's just that if you're a young person and wind up in the hospital with this infection, you are going to make the news. 
But what we need to know is for each young person who gets hospitalized or has a severe infection, how many had an asymptomatic infection or so nominally symptomatic that, that, you know, that they didn't report it to anybody and we didn't even know about it. Every country should have selected 10,000 people randomly by lottery and tested them for the presence of a SARS-CoV-2. This is called a randomized double-blind trial with a control group. No one has done this anywhere in the world, and it's the fifth month of the pandemic. This has never happened before in human history. I don't know what's happening with this pandemic. It's all, there is a delinquency of the medical profession that cannot be described and borders on the criminal. It is a reflexive first step in any pandemic, these randomized trials. Most, most viruses infect up to upward of 90% of the population. 90% of the population of Earth have herpes. Herpes viruses, herpes 1 and herpes 2, infect well over 90% of the population of Earth. Same goes for the human papilloma virus. So why not COVID? I mean, why not uh, SARS-CoV-2? Maybe the whole population is infected already, which changes completely, completely the calculus and what we should and shouldn't do. Then social distancing, for example, is useless. Then as inept as we were at the start of all this, inept in getting data, inept in making policy decisions, inept at, at thinking artfully about risk and inept about social distancing when we still had the time, if despite all of that, we actually manage to effectively interdict viral transmission at the population scale, then some of what we're seeing now is courtesy of social distancing and sheltering in place, it just is. And we would have more cases all around the country all at once if we hadn't taken those precautions, but we don't know. And so we really need population level testing of infectious status and immunity. That's really just ramping up now. Why we're so far behind is really frustrating, but that will answer that question. We're not doomed to never know, did interdiction make a difference? Are, are most Americans still naive to this virus, which means yet to be exposed? Or are there a lot of Americans who were exposed, never needed medical care, and now have antibodies? So I'm a little bit astounded, maybe, unless you tell me I shouldn't be, that they've shut down the economy without knowing quite what they're doing. I mean, I, I think... Um, am I... Am I, no, I? I'm astounded as well. This gives rise, of course, to conspiracy theories. The government is planning military rule all over the United States. Donald Trump is planning to postpone or cancel the elections. There are numerous conspiracy theories floating around. I think the truth is much simpler. The virus is an unknown entity, unknown quantity. No one knows what it is capable or not capable of doing. The thing is the law of unintended consequences. When we implement quarantine and social distancing, when we shut down all our economies, we are playing with fire. And I am not talking about unemployment benefits. I am not talking about the collapse of small and medium businesses. About two weeks ago, a locust swarm, 20 times the size of the largest swarm ever seen, descended upon East Africa. Today, another swarm had descended. It is 210 times the largest swarm ever seen before, 70 years ago. Nothing will be left of vegetation in Africa. Why all this? Because of social distancing and universal quarantine. People were not allowed to go out and spray the fields. Locust larvae multiplied, locust swarms descended. In a typical swarm, for you to understand, there are now 2 billion, that's billion with a B, insects. And this is only one of the unintended consequences of our foolish policies. Uh, in a sense, like people plug the, the worst case into, those, into their models. They project forward and say two to four million deaths. Newspapers pick up the two to four million deaths. Politicians have to respond. Um, and the scientific basis for that projection 
is is completely there's there isn't there there is no study underlying that scientific projection in the sense of that number that denominator of that number doesn't exist we don't know right. the european data includes the data in france where suddenly the number of cases doubled from one day to the next this is somebody finding finding a box of reports in an office and sending them in and said oops we forgot to report that over the last month so this the epidemic in france is not increasing anymore even though somebody found a couple of reports in a shoebox and why what when they won't well, won't governments just say that's because we did we practice social distancing i'm not a psychiatrist i don't know what other people think i'm a scientist i've been focused on trying to understand how many people actually have the covid virus infection uh, and so the last few weeks uh, since that uh, since that bed uh, i've been organizing or helping to organize uh, studies to figure out how many people have uh, antibodies to the virus in them inside uh, inside their bodies as evidence that they're uh, that they've had infection most people that get the virus actually are are going to have very few symptoms it's obviously a very deadly virus that some people it leads to hospitalizations and deaths. Uh, we've seen that in, in pictures all over the world. The question is, how large a fraction of the population is that? Uh, is, the, is the death rate 0.1 percent? Is the death rate 3 percent, like the World Health Organization originally said? It's a big difference: one in a thousand versus three in a hundred. Uh, I'd, I'd much rather avoid a three in a hundred chance of dying than a one in a thousand chance of dying. Everybody thought that uh, they had to do their best. So uh, they said we need to admit these people to the hospital even if they had modest or not so severe symptoms. This resulted in a very bad decision making and I think that this is something that every other setting that is hit by an epidemic wave needs to avoid. By admitting these mild or moderate cases very quickly they became saturated and when they started getting the severe cases, uh, they just had no room for them. So uh, also the hospital became heavily colonized with that new virus. Uh, this is a virus that can stay on surfaces. Uh, many of their medical personnel got infected in that heavily infested environment. Now, on the other hand, it is important to realize that, that, that there's no vaccine for this virus. So it's still something to worry about. And actually, as you said in your intro, uh, a very reasonable policy would be to sort of start carefully lifting the restrictions. But how can you make that decision without data? Uh, the, 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 what I'm hoping is to provide a way to get that data, to make those decisions in a wise way. Uh, by, by understanding how extensive the, the, the infection is, we can our, the models that people have been using to forecast uh, whether hospital systems will get overloaded. Well, they, they've been, they, they don't actually have good data to understand that because you don't know how many people actually have it. So uh, this is important to know because we'll finally be able to make good data driven decisions about when it's safe to lift up, uh, lift off the economic caps that we put in place, uh, how to protect vulnerable populations from, from the virus because that's certainly still gonna be a concern even as, especially as we start lifting up the caps. Um, I think we have been flying in the dark with policy because we don't have this information about the, extens the extensive spread of the virus. We don't really know how many have had this, this virus. Here's why that's so important. Everything you think you know, everything that makes you lie awake at night and worry about this is based on your perception of risk. Oh dear God, am I going to get this thing and die or is, is this going to kill somebody I love? And, and frankly, when all we get is information about hospitalization and death, it, it makes us all anxious about that. But if for each one of those stories, we knew a thousand people had the virus and got over it without noticing, or 10,000, whatever that number may be, it would be extremely reassuring. Suddenly we'd be able to compare this risk the way my colleagues have done to other more familiar risks. And, and we'd be able to say, okay, there, there's some chance of severe infection but on the other hand, if my health was reasonable before, it looks to be pretty remote. That would be very reassuring. We deserve to know that. We absolutely need that information for public policy. We need that information to know how to avoid medical system overwhelm site by site around the country. But you and I deserve it when we're lying awake at night worrying about all this. I would be very careful to make inferences based on single case reports and anecdotes. I, I feel that uh, every single patient has the dignity of uh, 
his life and uh, every single patient is a different story and we have to give great respect uh, to that uh, life and that person. But I'm worried that if we see in the news presentations of single cases as uh, heralded uh, being uh, something that I have never seen before, uh, this is so horrible, uh, that's the worst uh, case of uh, uh, severe uh, respiratory distress syndrome that I have seen, we are uh, falling into a trap of, of sensationalism. I mean, can you imagine what would have happened if uh, 60 million deaths that happen every year in this planet, we had a meter counting them uh, one by one and, and having stories written for each one of them. It, it, it would be horrible. I mean, we have, uh, we have gone into a complete panic state uh, measuring so far uh, a sizable number of deaths, but nothing, nothing close to the total cumulative mortality that we see both in this country and around this world. So I, I think we have to be very respectful of the harms of the pandemic, concentrated in place and time. But I think we also have to be very respectful of the fact that ultimately these numbers are small compared to the total population, and that we, we actually could wind up with more deaths due to social upheaval than to the infection. So both medical professionals and politicians panic simply panic. They want people to stay indoors because they don't know any better. They are not sure of what they're doing. I think one of the most distressing elements in all of this is that all that we seem to be hearing about are extreme positions. So flatten the curve indefinitely, which kind of translates to hunker in a bunker and hope there's a vaccine before you die of something else. What will happen when we come out of the lockdown? Okay. Populations that have been locked down, like New Zealand, have they missed the opportunity for herd immunity? Will they ever be able to get it because they have been kept isolated? So if, if your strategy to avoid exposure to the, pop, to, the, to the virus of the population has been highly effective, you're, you're in a part of the world where you're pretty well cut off from everybody else, a place like New Zealand, if there is no circulating virus and the, the levels of transmission fall to near zero, but almost nobody in the country has had it, you are forever at risk of a resurgence in the pandemic whenever somebody brings it to you from someplace else until there's a vaccine. So you, you remain vulnerable. So essentially every population has the choice of intermittently locking down whenever exposure recurs, staying in lockdown until there's a vaccine, however long that may prove to be, or working toward herd immunity by liberalizing exposure based on risk tiers. And again, the goal of total harm minimization would seem to argue for basing exposure on risk. There, there are these massive differentials. I, I keep returning to the global data. The virus is successful. It succeeds to infect people because the population is naive. In other words, the population, all of us, have never been exposed to this particular variant of SARS, SARS covariant 2. Vaccination is the keyword and the slogan on everyone's lips. Never mind that a proper vaccine won't be, won't be ready uh, in fewer than 18 months. So it'll take a year and a half, two years before a first operable vaccine is available. Never mind that all vaccines that we have tried with coronaviruses backfired badly and created even worse diseases. So we have tried, for example, a coronavirus vaccine with cats. And the cats, when they did catch the coronavirus disease, became much more ill than the cats which were not vaccinated. Vaccines in coronaviruses tend to enhance the disease, make it worse, not make it better, for reasons we don't fully understand. What are the options? One is a vaccine. Everybody rolls up their sleeve, everybody gets vaccinated, we're protected against coronavirus. Why is that a problem? Well, the most optimistic projections take us out 18 months. And if we're relying solely on a vaccine to protect us, it basically means whatever we're doing now, sheltering in place, that has to go on for at least a year and a half. And again, that's an optimistic projection. If we deny the virus 
bodies to infect, if we don't give the virus access to hosts, the virus will become really vicious just in order to survive. Now, of course, we don't need to make human sacrifices. We don't need to give old people, we don't need to give the virus access to old people, to immunocompromised people, to pregnant women, to weak people. These populations should be isolated, should be quarantined, should not be in touch with anyone. Herd immunity is something we have to talk about because it is the more proximal alternative to an all clear. It's the way we can go back to the world. And the way to get to herd immunity is, is not to put people at risk, but to risk stratify the population. Who among us can afford to be exposed to this virus? Because it's overwhelmingly probable we'll have an unpleasant infection at worst, an asymptomatic bout of it at best, we'll get over it, we'll make antibodies. Again, we need data to know. How many have done this already? Who are they? And we need to go out in waves so that the people who are most likely to get over this without any adversity do it first and the rates of transmission drop low and then the next wave that's at slightly higher risk can get exposed and if some numbers of us wind up getting sick enough to need the hospital, the hospital beds available for us. The countries which have implemented quarantine and social distancing late in the game are the countries where the fewest people are dying. Luckily for humanity, quarantines and social distancing are luxuries that only the self-indulgent and navel-gazing West can afford. The rest of the world can't implement it simply. People live in close quarters, the numerous homeless people, refugee camps, 70 million people are internally displaced and refugees, people live in villages. I mean, there's no way to implement these measures. Luckily for humanity. And you know, I think the best we can do while still in the midst of this is try not to rush to judgment, to get the best data possible. And again, make sure that the policy priority is total harm minimization. I do think that is the guiding light through this crisis. There is more than one way for this pandemic contagion to hurt people. It can hurt them directly via infection and it can hurt them indirectly via our responses to the contagion. And both are bad, preventing both is good, and we should be gathering more data every day to get better day by day at navigating between those dual perils. I, for the first time in my life, sympathize with conspiracy theories. I have written extensively against conspiracy theories. I've mocked conspiracy theories. But I must admit, had I been a weaker, less logical, more paranoid person, I would have ended up a conspiracy theorist after this pandemic or within this pandemic. Something is seriously awry. Something is seriously wrong with the reaction of the political elites and the medical establishment and the mainstream media.